thinking of my dad, who was killed by communists years ago. Actually, a day before my graduation, my doctoral graduation. So it's always very hard for me. So a lot of times I write and speak in memory of my dad and millions of other victims of communism who died for the freedom of speech and assembly that you guys take for granted. Um, the, their crimes were that they disagreed with the Communist Party Marxist ideology and protest the confiscation of their homes, uh, which is how my family, my entire family, lost everything they've ever owned. They lost their land, they've lost their guns, uh, they lost personal possessions, uh, they objected to the lack of food, heat, water, uh, proper medical care, medications, and a decent treatment in general as human beings. Um, may I have some water, please? Uh, when Margaret Thatcher once said, the problem with socialism is that at some point you run out of other people's money, thank you. She was referring to the deliberate attempt by a centralized socialist government to confiscate by various means, including nationalization, wealth that they viewed as unfairly earned at the expense of the masses. Marx had said, he was himself the original uh, hippie who never worked and was supported by rich patrons such as Friedrich Engels, uh, which by the way, he would have made a perfect Democrat socialist today. Um, so even he admitted that the proletariat does well the work. It is the, it, it's only fitting that the rich should share the ill-gotten wealth. And of course, you've heard the phrase repeated over and over in our society, the rich must pay their fair share, which has been repeated ad nauseum over the past few years. What wealth were we supposed to share equally under communism? Well, it was actually the wealth confiscated and stolen by force by communist party apparatchiks after throwing in jail citizen dissidents uh, for being bourgeois, and that meant that you have an extra acre of land or you may have had a nicer home or maybe nicer furniture, or maybe you had an extra gun for hunting. Uh, and such was the case of one of my uncles who had a nice home, and he went to jail uh, for almost 15 years. Um, I've, I've met a doctor when I first came to the United States who actually served in a lead mine because he had a private hotel in a ski resort in Sinaya. I don't know how this man survived the lead mine, but he did. Um, <clears throat> so we had equal mis misery, we had equal suffering, we have equal mistreatment, equal poverty, constant shortages of food, rationing of necessities, including toilet paper, uh, water, energy, heat, and of course medical care. For years as a teacher, I carried around a sample of toilet paper, which was actually produced after the fall of, fall of communism in 89, and you could clearly see the wood splinters in it. That's how well it was made. I'm being sarcastic. Um, and yet people were glad that they could find that. Classical socialists believed that socialism was an imperfect stage before communism. The means of production were owned by the state and workers were paid hourly wages for their work. And of course we had a motto in Romanian that said uh, they pretended to pay us and we pretended to work. So a lot of times people would hide for several hours during the work day and take a nap or do whatever. Uh, even Winston Churchill spoke against socialism. He said, quote, socialism is a philosophy of failure, the creed of ignorance, the gospel of en envy. Its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. And I can attest to that. The failed experiment with socialism, communism, um, at Jamestown, Virginia in 1620, taught us that when people work the land together as a collective, some were lazy and did much less work, while others who worked harder had to share their bounty with the slackers and, of course, resented them. 
The whole commune nearly starved to death. The following year, the land was divided again to each family and the settlement thrived. Communism was supposed to abolish classism. The workers were paid for their needs, not for the work they performed, from each according to his ability to each according to their need. But who decided the need and the level of pay? And who received the higher pay? Well, usually it was the Communist Party elites and their loyal lackeys, and who also received a monthly stipend uh, if they snitched on their neighbors or family. And this monthly stipend went for uh, better food. They had better access to the Communist Party stores. We have built in this country a permanent underclass that relies on welfare, being paid not to work according to their needs. 35 states pay more welfare per hour than a person actually earns working. And of course, now you can add to that all the illegal aliens who are given all the welfare the moment they cross the border uh, into our country. And of course, they are the low information voters who are voting for this type of communist living. The supposed classless communist society did have two classes, the proletariat who called each other comrades in chains and the ruling elites, and the, we were in chains. They shared and used all the wealth as they pleased according to their greedy needs. And we couldn't say anything about it because we didn't have any arms. They did, and they had the security police. Marxism does not work. It never worked in any of the countries that it has been tried, and it's not because it wasn't some smart American kid who is going to try it and do it better. It does not work because greed and jealousy are part of the human psyche. Not everyone is so altruistic that they're willing to work extremely hard for the good of everyone, knowing that those in power get their lion's share of the divided pie. Capitalism does work because of self-interest. One individual's hard work to achieve self-interest enables what Adam Smith called the invisible hand to push everyone else to greater economic achievement such that the, the poorest person in this country is actually uh, wealthier than most countries in the world. Uh, Marx himself said that capitalism is the most powerful mode of production available. Waiting on the dole and the spreading of wealth is the death of initiative, is the death of self-respect, dignity, honor in a good day's work, and the desire to improve one's standing in society and of their children. Self-interest also breeds charity. Communist elites were never charitable except to themselves. People living under communists were not charitable to strangers. They were charitable to their uh, families. They did perform volunteer activities involuntarily under the forced direction of communist rulers. Everyone was spied on and watched by communist organizers and snitches, and that included family members. The proletariat had to hoard food, some of them, enabled black markets, and in engaged in bartering stolen goods or raw materials from work in order to survive. They even stole public items that were not fastened uh, or nailed down strong enough if they could be sold for recycling. Uh, in some places, they got electrocu electrocuted trying to steal electrical parts of, of transformer stations. Private property was forbidden because it was created and uh, it bred unfair competition. Anyone caught by the economic police with extra goods and belonging was sentenced to jail. But the ruling elite and their lackeys could own as much private property as they could steal uh, or wished from the hapless proletariat and the, from, from the common means of production, which they say, well, you own the means of production. Well, you try to claim part of it and you would go to jail, of course. So we didn't own anything except the clothes on our backs. Even the apartments, we had to rent them uh, and they weren't worth having, but it was a place to be. Uh, and by the way, the apartment is still standing today where I grew up and I took my husband 
well, he took me by force several years ago because I hadn't been in 25 years and I was at the airport crying because I didn't want to be there. And so we went. So I took him to the apartment and he could barely move around. It was so tiny. I couldn't believe that it was uh, still, there, still there. In the communist utopia I experienced, the proletariat was given free health care and free education heavily infused with communist indoctrination. When they realized that I was coming to the U.S. to study and the Americans would benefit from my education because I was going to marry an American, they made me pay even for my high school education. And I said, okay, how much is it? And I had two years of college at that point. So some um, apparatchik calculated and it was $150. I said, okay, so I went and bought a cassette player, I think, which was about $150 at the time and from a duty-free shop. And then we sold that and we had the money to pay for my uh, 14, year, 14 years of uh, education. Communist education, that is. But we did have good basic math and science and foreign languages and that sort of thing. And the history, of course, was manufactured to fit the uh, communist ideology, just like yours is now manufactured to fit liberalism or progressivism. The children of elites were chosen first for college education. Healthcare was so dismal and pathetic, human life had no value. People were killed by malpractice in simple procedures. No accountability existed since everyone earned meager wages and worked for the omnipotent government that could not be sued. Doctors, nurses, teachers, and engineers were told where to live, where to practice their trade, and how much they could earn. People were forced to do everything in a communist society against their will, pretty much so. Uh, my husband was pretty enraged when, because he was an American, he couldn't enter social, uh, certain public buildings that the socialists deemed that it was not a suitable place for a capitalist, and an American capitalist at that. Mo modern socialists in Europe run bankrupt welfare states with a nanny mentality of cradle-to-grave entitlements. Exceptionalism is punished, global citizens are shaped by socialist schools, and groupthink is rewarded. Uh, but most inventions of the modern world uh, were the result of individual creativity and exceptional talent of one individual, maybe two, not of groups thinking for the collective or brainstorming for the collective. Communist China did not start to make economic progress until the centralized communist bureaucracy lessened its stronghold on the population and allowed individual creativity and entrepreneurship to thrive. However, they're now punishing dissent of the population through the social scoring, which by the way is coming to the US as well. They cannot fly um, unless they have a certain amount of points on their social scorecard. We had those in school uh, where we were given a grade for behavior. It was the same thing. And of course, we, if we got a bad grade, the parents were called to school in front of other parents and they were uh, thrashed verbally and so forth in front of everybody else and the students. The creeping socialism that Ronald Reagan and Friedrich von Hayek warned us about is here. Uh, we've had the government takeover of Chrysler, GM, student loan programs, banking and financial institutions. We've had Obamacare control of internet, of social media, FCC radio programming content, attacks on Christianity all the time, attacks on conservative speech and values, and I being um, a writer, of course, I'm uh, often censored for that reason. Uh, socialists hide behind political speech, clever euphemism, rhetoric, deception, manipulation, lies, propaganda, class and racial division, accusations of hate speech, bigotry, racism, homophobia, Islamophobia are intended to stifle free speech. Communist terms that I had left behind 41 years ago 
are now part of everyday politics, social justice, economic justice, social engineering, community organizing, nationalization, social democracy, redistributive change, equitable society, open society, social change, working class, communitarian, redistributive change. It's a pretty long list, but I'm sure there are more euphemism out there. They all mean one word, communism. Communism never died, really. It is making a comeback, thanks to the Democrat Party and all the NGO lackeys, non-governmental organizations, which have plenty, plenty of money. Um, you have Communist Party USA, you have Socialist Party of America, you have teachers, college professor, unions, ignorant Americans on welfare, you've had the Occupy Wall Street movement, you have the Antifa movement, which are very much fascist that they think they fight against, uh, you have the mainstream media, and of course, uh, the worst, the United Nations Agenda 21, the design of global communism, which is now in every locale where you live. Uh, Norman Mattoon Thomas, who lived in 1884 to 1968, a leading American socialist and six-time presidential candidate for the Socialist Party of America, explained best the status of socialism in the U.S. Quote, the American people will never knowingly adopt socialism, but under the name of liberalism, they will adopt every fragment of the socialist program until one day America will be a socialist nation without knowing how it happened. I no longer need to run as a presidential candidate for the Socialist Party. The Democrat Party has adopted our platform. It appears that they have reached that goal. Seventy members of Congress have declared themselves members of the Socialist Party uh, more than a decade ago, and now there are even more. We are governed by progressives. Our minds are molded by socialists. Our tastes are formed by communism-loving Hollywood. Our ideas suggested by communists and by men we have never even heard of, like George Bernard Shaw, a Fabian socialist and eugenicist, and by John Dewey, the most influential American Marxist and progressive theorist of education and founder of our current public school teaching practice and ideology. And of course you have to have a license from the College of Education and the Department of Education to be such a teacher. If you're a graduate from arts and sciences like I am, you're not entitled to have a teaching license. America is under siege in a state of propaganda encouraging the brainwashing of the population to support a socialist, uh, eventually communist state or one party state if you'd like. We are following in the failed multi multicultural steps of Europe, which is overrun by illegal aliens who are going to be uh, amnestied eventually who have no intention of assimilating. America is in no social and economic position to absorb so many millions without its self-destruction as a superpower. We're being colonized from within by communist tyranny and its supporting hordes. Uh, I call it the tyranny of the oppressed, quote unquote. And what will we get in return? Well, we're not gonna have private property, my family all of them have lost their private property to the communists. Uh, my mom lost it twice because she came here by defecting uh, during Ronald Reagan's administration. And um, so they even took her retirement away. She got it back eventually, but it took years of fighting and lawyers and whatnot. Uh, we will have no right of inheritance, no right to bear arms. Only Ceausescu had arms when he went hunting with machine guns. I'm surprised there are still bears in Romania. He slaughtered so many. Um, there will be total government dependency. To this day, there are people who are, who are still 
missing communism because they were so dependent on the government, they can't make decisions on their own. I'm talking about elderly Romanians. The younger Romanians who have never witnessed communism, but they have been brainwashed by the textbooks published by these American NGOs who went all over the world right after the quote-unquote fall of communism. Um, you were gonna, you're going to get centralized communication. We pretty much have that in the mass media. Um, we do have some alternative information, but a lot of times think, people think, Americans think it's not legitimate news. We're going to have centralized transportation, means of productions owned by the government, equitable distribution of population density across permitted areas, and see Agenda 21 for that. Uh, free education, if it's worth having, industrial armies, agricultural armies, and we'll have equal wages. And I want to make one more mention that um, this Vladimir Bukovsky, who is a very good Russian writer, just published a book in English called Judgment in Moscow. I don't know the gentleman, but you should read the book because he had found actual documents in Russia which he had sent to London and he wrote this book, and these documents show that the reason we have global communist today, communism today is because all our current governments were in cahoots with the uh, ideology and uh, the plans of the underground communists who have rebranded themselves. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. We are on a history lesson right now, uh, which is important because we learned uh, yesterday that they're not teaching history in schools, so we better teach it here because how else are we all going to learn the history? Uh, the, um, in uh, seven years, the United States is going to celebrate our 250th founding, and um, it's important we know our history in order to celebrate our history. And that's why we have brought uh, Wilfred McClay to speak next, because uh, he, is, he is, has a chair in history, the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma. And he has written a, a, a new book with the idea of, of explaining the history of the United States in counter to some of the, um, shall we say, incorrect histories that are being taught in, a, in our uh, schools today. And his new book is A Land of Hope, An Invitation to the Great American Story. Please welcome Wilfred McClay. Thank you. I'm, I'm hoping to bring a little sunshine into the room. Uh, we, we, we don't have any windows, but uh, 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 Ileana mentioned the textbook uh, problem, and, you know, we have something of the same thing here. Uh, not quite as bad, but um, the textbooks that we have are uh, in American history, which is the field I teach in for the most part, are, are very inadequate uh, in various ways. They're they're ideologically uh, infected. They're fragmented. They present the American past as, as a, a, a pastiche of incidents and episodes and identity groups uh, with, without large overarching themes except perhaps oppression. Um, and they, they, they don't have a story to them. They don't have a narrative quality. They don't have, uh, they're not readable. They're very poorly written. In fact, that was the thing that struck me when working on my, my book more than anything else. I expected to find more ideological inflection than I did, but the writing was infinitely worse. And I, I found some of the books unreadable myself. I mean, they're textbooks for high school and college students, so uh, I, I, I couldn't imagine what, uh, what students would do with it. I've never used textbooks in my own teaching. Uh, a number of years ago, I guess it's been about tw almost 20 years ago, I wrote a little book for ISI books, you know, Intercollegiate Studies Institute. I'm sure many of you know that worthy organization. That's one of their student guides series. And this was the student's guide to U.S. history. And I had a bibliography in it, but I didn't include a textbook. 
And for years now, I've been getting letters and emails from people who say, hey, I really liked your student guide, but why don't you recommend a textbook? And I patiently have written back, and then there may even be somebody in this room who's gotten one of these letters from me, um, uh, saying, well, there just isn't one I can recommend. Um, and I don't know why it took so long to occur to me that, well, maybe maybe, the, maybe the, some transcendent force was trying to tell me something by that, that I should do this. And then uh, a, a less than transcendent force, Roger Kimball of Encounter Books uh, started knocking on my door. And there were a number of other things that I won't go into now, but um, that influenced me. And I thought, well, this is something that really needs to be done. Uh, so I wrote Land of Hope. Um, and in fact, the first thing I wrote in writing the book was the title. Uh, I knew somehow that was the title that I wanted, the, the title that it should be. And um, much of the rest of the book you know, kind of flows from that. Um, and I, it is an effort to, to say in some sense what the American story is, that it is a story of hope of hope, not always hope realized, uh, but it's hope as an aspirational force, as a material, but also a spiritual force. Uh, and that, that is something that unifies much of our national life. Um, there are other themes that I weave in and out of the book, but it's, it's, a, it's a fairly coherent um, account of the American past, which is the kind of thing I couldn't find 20 years ago when I was writing the ISI guide. Um, uh, it goes against the currents in a number of ways. Um, it, for one thing, it's a book. <laughs> it's a physical book, an object in space uh, the, that uh, uh, the contents of which are permanent. Uh, it is not, you know, it's not a digital object. And this is not a small thing. Uh, uh, and it, I mean, it's something we thought about a lot. What, how should we do this? Should we be online? Should we be digital? Uh, and uh, Pearson, which is one of the big three uh, textbook publishers, has made the decision to go, uh, um, they call it digital first, but it's really going to be all digital eventually, um, with 1,500 of their textbooks, uh, and including their, all their American and European and world history textbooks. Um, this is really an, a, a, an interesting development. The students will be required eventually to be tethered to the platforms that those publishers supply. And yes, it will have the benefit that uh, uh, the results of new research, most of which is bad in American history, can be, can be added. Uh, you can find out the Civil War was actually not what you thought it was. Uh, uh, the nation was actually founded in 1619. You know, all sorts of interesting new findings can be inserted. Um, it's sort of like George Orwell's Ministry of Truth, uh, in which uh, the, the revision of the past is taking place yeah, silently. I, um, in the early days of printing, printers had a say, like, saying that they uh, they hung in the, the walls of their of their of their workshops, uh, "Litera scripta manet," which means the written written word uh, remains. Uh, the the printed word, uh, the written letter, actually, uh, the li written letter remains. Uh, and uh, at that time, it was meant to contrast the oral. Word, word that you know, speech is is there and then it's gone. But the the, the written letter remains. It, it, it's a, a, a sign of permanence. Now, it's uh, the written word remains as comparison to the the image on a screen. You know, we're a civilization. Our Judeo-Christian tradition makes us people of the book, uh, and but we're in the process of becoming people of the screen of the, the revisable, of the fluid, of the uh, uh, endlessly adaptable and uh, unstable, uh, kind of like what we heard about in the previous session. Um, so uh, uh, the Land of Hope is, is an effort to kind of nail down in some permanent form what we mean uh, by the national story. Um, it's also a book that goes against the, the grain because it isn't dumbed down. And that's not to say it's not accessible. I think it's much more accessible than any 
of the mainline uh, textbooks out there. Uh, but it's not, it's not an effort to, um, to uh, deal with the sort of declining uh, literacy of, of uh, unfortunately, of many young people. Uh, uh, there's no substitute for reading. Uh, there simply is no substitute for reading. We must get our young people reading. Again, uh, uh, they can't, the images will not do the job of teaching them how to think, teaching them how to uh, understand and analyze uh, the narratives within which their lives are suspended. So we have to do that. We have to, and, and what better way to do it than by providing them with something that will fire their imagination and have stories within a larger story because narrative, uh, as I want to get to in a minute, is one of the things we absolutely need as human beings. Um, so uh, it, that's, that's one of my hopes. And so far, by the way, I, I should mention in passing that uh, as I was writing and I shared chapters both with some of my colleagues, uh, university professors and researchers, and, uh, and with uh, high school teachers, because I have many high school, I've taught for 30 years, I have many high school teachers who uh, were my students, including some who got PhDs under my direction and are uh, chairs of departments at the leading independent schools in the country. Uh, and uh, the first group said, oh, you know, this, the writing level on this is much too high. You're going to have to dumb this down. This isn't going to be going to work. The teachers all said, yeah, my students, they, they're going to like this. They can handle this. So uh, it, it's an interesting paradox that now these were independent, almost exclusively independent school teachers. Uh, and I think for reasons we've already heard about, it's going to be very difficult for a book like this to penetrate public schools, even, even in red states. Uh, so we're realistic about that. But homeschoolers and uh, independent schools, uh, schools so I... I hoping for the book to have a real audience in, in that, those settings. So uh, a couple, few other uh, sort of unifying themes that I think will bring out some sense of the book's distinctiveness. And, and by the way, I'm, I apologize. I do not have a copy here with me to show you. We, we, we were some... Oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there was supposed to be, uh, I, I get to blame the publisher. This is actually, they've been great. Encounter is a wonderful publisher. Uh, 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 but, you know, we're, we're kind of, the book has had such a reception that we've been, we're in the third printing already. We've been sort of scrambling around. They're not used to this kind of thing, and I certainly am not. I mean, <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, uh, but here, here it is. Uh, so you see it's a sort of textbook size thing, uh, and uh, uh, about 500 pages, uh, but very, I think, and, and it does have illustrations, but it does not have, this is one of the things I insisted on when they signed me up, I will not do sidebars and jazzy graphics and uh, tables and, and uh, uh, lo lots of little, little interjections and pull quotes and that sort of thing. I want it to look like a dignified, regular book. And so it does. Uh, anyway, I, the, the publisher was supposed to supply a big stack of them so that you could buy it, and it did, they didn't turn up. So, um, so I hadn't even brought a copy with me. I figured there'd be copies here. So I, I, I'll probably, here, I'll put it up here like this. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, very good, very good, very good. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I could say more about how great Encounter has been, but uh, so this is just their one mess up. So let me just briefly, because I don't have a lot of time, and I, my, my fellow Oklahoman, Trent, uh, I, I need to give him time to talk about the Electoral College, but uh, let me talk about a few of the themes, and then I want to read you some passages so you can get a sense of, of the writing, uh, and you, you may decide, oh, this, this is terrible, but, but, <laughs> but at least you won't have to take my word for it. Uh, uh, first of all, the, the land in the title. The, the, the title itself contains a number of the sort of thematic distinctives. It, it, first of all, it's a land of hope. It's not, yes, America is um, a nation that uh, is dedicated to certain ideals, ideas, if you will, but America is not just an idea. Uh, it is not 
even principally an idea. It is a land. It is uh, a place where those ideals have uh, gradually come into, uh, into to usage, come to be normative, come to be uh, uh, an integral part of who and what we are. Uh, uh, equality, liberty, opportunity, which I think is maybe the, the, in some sense the most, most quintessential American value. Um, so, so uh, but America is not simply these things. You can't teach young people or anybody what America is simply by pounding in an abstract way on these ideals and, and think you've done the job. It, it is a story. It's a venerable history of people who, uh, in many cases, get, sacrifice their lives in order to create and sustain the order that we have now. So Arlington National Cemetery, I hope I'm pointing in the right direction, <laughs> is, uh, is, is an example of that, of the, the, the veneration that is what holds us together. It's not just shared ideals, it's shared memories, it's shared, uh, 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 shared values invested in and rooted in, in a sense of the past, and a sense of the national story. Um, second, hope, land of hope. and. This gives me a chance to explain a little bit more what I had in mind by the, uh, that, uh, that title. I meant to say you, you don't describe a country merely by itemizing all its material factors, all of the measurable things. It, there is a, a, the quantifiable things are important, but there, there's a quality about America, and that quality I would call a spiritual quality, an aspirational quality, a sense that what, if, if, if there's nothing else that we believe, it is that people should not be confined by birth to the economic, socioeconomic status into which they were born. That people should have the ability to, to, uh, to seek opportunities, to spread their wings, to, to grow, to work hard, to attain. Uh, and this is by no means uh, uh, something to be taken for granted. It's certainly not the norm in human history. Uh, or even in modern history. Um, so something, again, that our students uh, don't appreciate. I, I, I wish that we could teach the history of the unfree world as part of American history so that uh, the students would have something to compare what they're learning about to. They tend, understandably, because they don't know anything, they tend to compare uh, uh, America with its actual imperfections to a standard of perfection and say, I can't get behind that. I can't, uh, I, I can't pledge my allegiance to that because they're comparing it to perfection uh, instead of to an actual society, an actual human history, which has flaws that leave ours <laughs> panting in the dust. So um, th the third uh, element, third thematic element is, is story, the great American story. And obviously, I wanted to call it a great story, not just any old story. Uh, partly as a way of conveying, it's about the whole thing. It's the it's the, the great American story in that way, but also it's a, it's a, it's a, an admirable story. And uh, here, I want to read a, a little bit from the the book to guess, again to give you a sense of my outlook. And uh, um, and uh, I, I'm told that one of the, that we should conclude our talks with some call to action. So, you know, the call to action, I'll just give it to you right now, is to try to convince anybody you know who's involved in education uh, to, to um, take a look at this book. And we will be happy to supply copies uh, to educators gratis, you know, who are interested in, in the possibility of adopting the book. So, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll, at the very end, I'll give you my email address and all of that, although you can find me, people always manage to. You know. <clears throat> but, so let me read a little bit about story and the importance of story in human existence. The impulse to write history and organize our world around stories is intrinsic to us as human beings. We are, at our core, remembering and story-making creatures. And stories are one of the chief ways we find meaning in the flow of events. What we call history and literature are merely the refinement and intensification of that basic human impulse, that need. The word need is not an exaggeration. For the human animal, 
Meaning is not a luxury, it is a necessity. Without it, we perish. Historical consciousness is to civilized society what memory is to an individual person. Without memory, without the stories by which our memories are carried forward, we cannot say who or what we are. Without them, our life and thought a dissolve into a meaningless, unrelated rush of events. Without them, without stories, that is, we cannot do the most human things. We cannot learn, use language, pass on knowledge, raise our children, establish rules of conduct, engage in science, dwell harmoniously in society. Without them, we cannot even govern ourselves. Nor can we have a sense of the future as a time we know will come because we remember that other tomorrows have also come and gone. A culture without memory will be barbarous and easily tyrannized, even if it's technologically advanced. The incessant waves of daily events will occupy all our attention. Does this sound familiar at all? <laughs> the incessant waves of daily events will occupy all our attention and defeat all our efforts to connect past, present, and future distorting and, and diverting us from an understanding of the human things that unfold in time, including the past of our own lives. The stakes were beautifully expressed in the words of the great Jewish writer Isaac Bashevis Singer, quote, when a day passes, it is no longer there. What remains of it? Nothing more than a story. If stories weren't told or books weren't written, Man would live like the beasts, only for the day. The whole world, all human life, is one long story. Close quote. As, and Singer, I think, was right. As individuals, as communities, as countries, we're nothing more than flotsam and jetsam without the stories in which we find our lives meaning. Which is why the deconstruction of American history, whether by ideologically or simply by hyper-professionalization, uh, study of smaller and smaller increments of life instead of looking at the large picture, is so immensely destructive to us because it means that we are losing our story. Um, of course, there are stories and there are stories. Uh, Andre Malraux, the French writer, said once, that a man is what he hides, a miserable little pile of secrets. Well, we've all read biographies like that. <laughs> Sometimes we've even had sort of guilty pleasures to see a takedown of somebody. But, but that kind of biography, that kind of history, uh, misses something important. It misses, to stick with biography, it misses the aspirational element. It misses the striving of the subject, of the man or woman, uh, of his ideals, his efforts at transcending his flaws. Is it a fair and accurate picture to present someone in that way, simply uh, in terms of their miserable little pile of secrets? Or is that uh, only part of the story? Uh, especially with the United States, to uh, focus obsessively on our undeniable faults uh, and make them the, the whole picture, to, to, to bring the whole perspective around to focus on them. Is that a fair? Uh, a portrait of a nation that is arguably the most successfully aspirational country in the history of the human race. A um, couple of other things. I'm realizing I'm kind of running out of time. Aren't I? How much? How much time do I have? None. Three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I guess I should give you my. Uh, okay. Let me. I'm going to push you a little bit. See, I wanted to read it in, in conclusion. Uh, this is a a passage that will take a little more than three minutes, but not much, I promise you. <laughs> and I'm not going to do the auctioneer's sort of reading. Uh, 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 but this is about the surrender of Lee uh, to um, Grant at the end of the Civil War. And, uh, uh, and I'll skip over some of it uh, in the interest of time, but uh, it, it's at Appomattox Courthouse, as you all know, I think. Uh, um, and just let me, this is my writing here. It's a, it was a poignant scene, dignified and restrained and sad, as when a terrible storm has raged and blown, 
but has finally exhausted itself, leaving behind a strange and reverent calm, purged of all passion. Uh, and then I go on to talk about the fact that Lee and Grant actually had known one another. They had fought in the Mexican War together, and, and uh, uh, a lot of description of them, uh, uh, which I would love to read to you. But you'll have to get the book to, to, uh, <laughs> to read it. But, uh, but then the next day, uh, the, the army uh, came marching and to lay down their arms. And, uh, and uh, Joshua Chamberlain uh, was a general from Maine, uh, uh, and a hero at Gettysburg, uh, uh, wrote the following description of this, this event, of this, the Confederate soldiers parading and laying down their arms. <clears throat> Before us in proud humiliation stood the embodiment of manhood, men whom neither toils and sufferings nor the fact of death nor disaster nor hopelessness could bend from their resolve. Standing before us now, thin, worn, and famished, but erect, and with eyes looking level into ours, waking memories that bound us together as no other bond, was not such manhood to be welcomed back into the Union so tested and assured. On our part, not a sound of trumpet more, nor a roll of drum, not a cheer, nor word, nor whisper of vainglory, nor motion of man standing again at the order, but an awed stillness and breath holding as if it were the passing of the dead. Um, it strikes me, the reason I wanted to read this in conclusion is it does strike me that, that uh, this is a story about a man who led, led men who, uh, in, who were in mortal battle with just days before uh, with these very individuals that they now saw parading before them and with such admiration, with such uh, willingness to welcome them back into the Union. Uh, this is a, a, a generosity that's almost beyond the conception of most of us, but if they could show that much generosity to those whom they had opposed, certainly we could show a little more generosity in this culture now to those in, the, in, the, in what is by now a far more distant past. Um, and I'd better stop before I get the hook. Thank you. Out on our resource table, there are pamphlets from uh, uh, the publisher on how to get this book, The Land of uh, Hope, and so we welcome to pick up those pamphlets so you can read more of the prose of the story of our great land. Uh, a couple of years ago, somebody asked me, uh, are you one of those kooks that believes you have constitutional rights? Yeah, I am one of those kooks. And I'm grateful for people who remind us of the plain language of the document and what it means in the operation of our government. And so our next speaker is Trent England, and he is the director of Save Our States. And he's going to talk about the Electoral College. Uh, uh, just, it was just a, a couple of months ago the New York Times editorialized that we had to get rid of the Electoral College. Well, there are good reasons why that we want to protect it, and we, yes, we have to explain it. I hope uh, maybe in your history book you have something about the Electoral College and why it's uh, an important thing. So please welcome uh, our next speaker who uh, has a, a degree from George Mason University School of Law, and he is also Executive Vice President at the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Welcome, Trent England. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. It is a real uh, pleasure to to be here, and uh, I have to thank um, uh, I have to thank Julia for coordinating all of this, and Janine Hansen for suggesting me. I think as a speaker, and uh, and say hi to Cindy Honkoop from Washington State, where where I grew up and, and worked for a long time, and uh, um, and then recognize also my friend Michael Maybach, who's here, who directs the Center for the Electoral College, uh, an, an ally of, uh, of of mine and all of ours. I think in this in this fight. Um, I was uh, I, I spoke last night at a, a, a very liberal college as part of a debate program in Manhattan, um, and so uh, and so I'm really glad to be here because uh, because I, I think I think there'll probably be less hissing uh, <laughs> in the audience. I'm I'm hoping um, it was. I, I will say this: um, Lawrence O'Donnell was the moderator, and uh, and so you know I w I was a little bit 
worried. Uh, you know, of course, coming from Washington State, um, you know, you, you, you get used to these things. But uh, he was scrupulously fair. I, I have to say that. I was, I was, really, I was really impressed. He was, he was scrupulously fair. Um, but I did have someone come up to me at the end and say, well, you know, I don't understand how you can defend this part of the Constitution because obviously it was all about racism and slavery. And, uh, and I, I, I know. And I, I said, you know, it, it seems to me that, that that's not a, a very good argument because, you know, the whole Constitution was written together, right? And so, I mean, do you think the First Amendment is about racism and slavery and we should get rid of it, right? And, and uh, um, she just sort of wandered, wandered off after that. But... Uh, um, I, I, muttering something about how she was sure that I was a white supremacist or something like that. But uh, uh, anyhow, I mean, it, it, but all in all, the New York crowd, despite some boos and hisses and, and that little incident, was, was, very, was very pleasant, but obviously um, not very convinced because they would benefit, as we'll talk about, from, uh, from abolishing or hijacking the Electoral College. So I want to do three things here real quickly. Oh, and, and my, my cartoon is up there, and I guess I, I probably can push these buttons to, uh, there we go, uh, to uh, get to what, I, I, I want to talk about the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which is the threat, but I want to start off for just a moment talking about the history of the Electoral College. And a lot of you have probably seen the, the, the imprimis um, that uh, I wrote for in, in June. Um, if you haven't, I have some extra copies uh, that I brought with me, and I, I can give you one afterwards. Um, I, I was actually, I was delighted. Um, I saw that I was going to speak after Bill McClay and, uh, here, and then, uh, and then the next Imprimus was, was from Bill McClay. So we've got, I don't know where we'll show up again, but um, I, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a privilege. I think we pack a good one-two punch here. So uh, I, I want to talk about the, the story of the Electoral College real quick, because I, I think this is important to understand, um, and, and I love it for the following reason. When you go back and read the history of the, the Constitutional Convention and the debates over electing a president, you discover just how innovative and just how honest and just how practical were the American founders. You know, they, they started off with, a, with something very conventional, a parliamentary model. The Virginia Plan, the, the original rough draft of the Constitution introduced at the beginning of the convention called for Congress to elect a president, right? A parliamentary model, how lots of countries still do it today. This is, this is the other thing that someone told me last night. They said, well, every other country, I've heard this so many times, every other country elects their president with a popular vote. And I, I said, well, you know, I mean, how do you think the prime minister of, of, of Britain, Great Britain is elected? Well, by a popular vote. Like, okay, this is, this is going to take longer than, you know, than the... the uh, so, uh, you know, of course, you know, a, a parliamentary system is, if you're interested in one person, one vote, you know, democracy is your, your highest goal, right? A parliamentary system is worse than our electoral college, if that's, if that's what you, uh, your ultimate value. Uh, they, they started off with that, but the problem was, and the problem with the parliamentary system is that it, it makes your executive the lackey of your, of, of your legislators, Right? You don't have a separation of powers. Right, Congress has a lackey. And, and how do they ser select their lackey? By horse trading, by politics. Right, So you wind up with congressional politics determining who gets elected and, uh, and, and really controlling the executive branch. And it's interesting to see, right, they, they, would, they would put forward the, uh, the parliamentary model and they would bring this up and they, they kind of all, you get this sense reading the debates from Madison's notes and some of the other notes and letters that survive. They all kind of agreed, like, this is, we don't want to do this, but there's not another model. And they went through all kinds of things. What if we had state governors elect the president? Well, these are also politicians, right? This, you know, this, this is maybe better in some ways, but maybe worse in other ways, and it's, it's going to break down the vertical separation of powers between the federal government and the states. So they didn't want to do that. At one point, the most out-of-the-box thing uh, that, that was proposed, they said, well, well what if we, we have Congress select the president, but we have members of Congress go up and they'll draw marbles out of a jar. And whoever gets the, the certain colored marbles, that group of members of Congress will be ushered into a room, locked in, and we won't let them out until they choose the president. Right? So no horse trading. Nobody knows who it's going to be ahead of time. I mean, I, I, read, I, you know, I read this. I remember the first time I read this. I thought, I mean, wow, like this, 
this is really sort of some oddball stuff. There wasn't a lot of debating about it um, afterward. I think they, they just sort of realized that, that that might seem maybe a little too much like selecting a, 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 a pope, frankly. Um, they'd have to have white smoke come out of the, the rotunda or something. Uh, so uh, at the, finally, um, toward the end, uh, they hit on the idea, well, what if we create another Congress? I mean, you think about it. This is really what the Electoral College is, right? It never all meets in the same place. But they said, look, we hammered out this, we hammered out this uh, uh, compromise, right, between the, the big states like New York and Virginia and the small states like pretty much everybody else. Uh, and, of course, New York and Virginia, right, a, a state in the north, a state in the south. There were small states in the north, small states in the, in the south. They hammered out this compromise. They said, look, what if we just take that compromise and we create a body that exists only to elect a president. You know, it comes into existence, elects it. So these aren't, these aren't politicians in any sense other than that they are elected officials, but their only job is to elect a president, and then they go away, right? And, uh, and when they're debating this, James Madison stands up, and, and uh, they've, been, they've been talking also about just having a direct popular election. And some, some of the founders, some of the framers supported that. And James Madison stands up and he says, look, he says, I support that too, a, a direct national popular vote, except, right, it sounds good in theory, right, sort of like, like people tell us about communism, right? It, it sounds good in theory, but Madison says, look, the problem is in practice it would be dangerous for the following reason that's still true today. Uh, and, and, you know, not that people were stupid. That's the New York Times always, oh, they just did this because they thought people were stupid. Well, you know, th there were concerns about people's access to information and all that. But Madison says, look, the, the problem is uh, we have some dense population areas in our country, and we have some very rural parts of our country and lots of small towns. And if we go with a direct popular vote, it sounds so good. It's so easy to explain, right? It'd make the job of, of uh, civics teachers so easy. But if we did that, it would entrench power basically in New York and in Virginia, and everybody else would be left out. As a practical matter, everybody else would be left out. And Madison points out, right, this is not healthy for a political system, right? People have to believe that their voice can be heard, right? This is, this is important, right? And, 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 and so Madison kind of pushes them to, let's go back to this electoral college idea. Let's flesh this out. There's a committee called the Committee of the Eleven because they selected one delegate from each state that was, that was there represented at the convention. Right at the end, at the 11th hour, uh, the Committee of Eleven, they go and they come back with the electoral college basically as it exists today. And uh, uh, w w with the one exception that uh, the runner-up doesn't become vice president anymore, um, which, which I think is a good thing, although, you know, in the world of Twitter, um, I mean, just just imagine what those what those uh, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton fights on Twitter would look like, right? How many how many dummy Twitter accounts would uh, Thomas Jefferson have? Do you think? Uh, so yeah, just just mull on that. Um, so they uh, so they create the electoral college and they give the power to the states. And and here's what it here's what the constitutional provision says. Each state shall appoint, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress. And then uh, this is in Article 2, Section 1, and then it, it goes on uh, to describe a little bit more, and then the modification in, uh, in the 12th Amendment to uh, the, the, you know, casting separate votes for president and vice president rather than just having the runner-up uh, become, uh, become vice president. So that's the constitutional provision. Pretty simple. Right? And everybody understood what the purpose was. The purpose was to keep the, keep the election at the state level. Right? It distributes power, keeps it within the states, and then give the states flexibility to decide how best to represent their own state's political will in the process. Everybody understood that until about 15 years ago. And about 15 years ago, the, the National Popular Vote Campaign came on the scene. Um, founded by John Koza, who, uh, who was at the debate um, last night on the other side. Uh, he's a very nice, uh, very smart gentleman, uh, a, uh, a, a major donor to far-left political causes. He invented the scratch-off lottery ticket back in the 1970s. 
and then spent the 80s traveling around to state legislatures convincing them to adopt scratch-off lotteries. You know, this was going to be the solution to all their education funding needs, right? Um, didn't really do that, but it did solve some of John Coase's needs. And, uh, uh, and he's reinvested his, his, uh, his gambling winnings um, into national popular vote, which, I mean, they have essentially unlimited money, as far as I can tell. Uh, and, uh, and he was an Al Gore elector in 2000 in California. And so obviously he was very upset about the outcome. Uh, but he's also, he's also very wealthy and he's also very smart. And so he started casting around for some way to get rid of the Electoral College. Uh, but he was smart enough to know that you know, pushing a constitutional amendment was a fool's errand. Right? He, just, there, there, he wasn't going to be able to build the national consensus in his, li in his lifetime to achieve that. And so he found a couple of law professor brothers, uh, Vikram David Amar and Akhil Amar, who had come up with this idea. What if we use this power in the Constitution, this power that state legislatures have, and we get states to just agree to ignore how the people in their own state vote and instead to, to elect their presidential electors, not based on the vote of the people in their state, but based on the vote of the people nationwide. If we could do that, then you don't have to change the Constitution, but you have the, the exact same effect of having abolished the Electoral College completely and having a direct election for president, right? You get, a, a, I mean, the effect of a national popular vote, while it still has to be carried out at the state level, and we'll probably talk toward the end about, it, it's, actually the, it's actually the worst way to get rid of the Electoral College because it's an end run, because it, it tries to overlay one system on another system. Uh, it, it's very dangerous and unstable, and actually, you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, because Vikram David Amar, one of these law professors who came up with this plan, he, he actually didn't want it to take effect um, right away. He, he wanted it to have a trigger when they hit the trigger, which I'll describe in just a minute. He wanted there to be a, it to start a 10-year clock because he's, he admits, and he just wrote something about this recently, he admits it is not really a stable system. It's a way to create enough political instability that people would then have to amend the Constitution. And, and get rid of the Electoral College. And to, you know, today, I will, I will add in there, if the left was to write a constitutional amendment that had to do with, with elections, they would not just gut the Electoral College, they would also gut the First Amendment. They're on record. There are constitutional amendments proposed in Congress to do that, right? If we create so much instability that they get to run an amendment um, to, to fix the problem that they, that they themselves would have created, right, it will go far, I think, beyond uh, just getting rid of the Electoral College. Um, so, but, but John Coza wanted, he wanted this to go into effect right away. Um, so the way national popular vote works is as soon as they hit 270 electoral votes, as you can see up there on the screen, um, that's an electoral college majority. That would control the outcome of presidential elections um, unless states dropped out of the compact. If they can get enough states to adopt this legislation that, that those states control 270 electoral votes, this would take effect and would control the outcome. And as you can see there, 15 states, plus the District of Columbia, worth 196 electoral votes, have adopted national popular vote, right? This is not theoretical. Um, this is very real. So what would, what would the consequences of this be? Um, obviously, right, James Madison's observation is still correct. Right? If, if, you, uh, if you move to a direct election system, that puts more powers in big cities. Right, which I'm, I'm sure is a part of why my New York crowd last night um, was so much on the on the side of doing away with the electoral college. Right, it would it would benefit those areas, and and the easiest way to explain this to people because I get pushback on this. People say, "Oh, come on, it would you know NPV would make every voter equal, everybody be equal, everybody get the same attention," and I'll, you know. A lot of you have been involved in, in, in uh, political campaigns here, and so you, you just know instinctively why this is not true. I ran for the state legislature in Washington State, right? And when you, when you start out a campaign, especially in the ground game, right, you've got, in, in, in the district I was in, um, I had a lot of people who lived down long driveways with big dogs, and I had a lot of people who lived in, in subdivisions, right? And obviously, you go to the subdivisions first, and you really never go down the long driveways with the big dogs. It's dangerous. Uh, and, and, and I learned you don't go into the cities uh, sometimes. Uh, so, some parts of the cities can be dangerous too. But uh, and somebody, somebody, anyhow, run a pistol slide on me from the other side of a door when I was doorbelling, and I, I left that. Uh, I didn't leave a flyer. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, no, you, you go to the places where people are densely packed, right? It's just common sense. The founders understood this. It's still true today. National popular vote would shift power to the cities. It would eliminate the boost that small states get uh, from having two senators, right, which is a part of the compromise that formed our Constitution. And some people, some people have raised the question about whether this violates Article 5 because Article 5 says, and I, I don't think it does, but it, 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 does, it does make the point. You know, Article 5 says the one thing in the Constitution that cannot be amended without unanimity, anybody know what it is? Equal suffrage in the Senate, right? The, I mean, the most important part of the Constitution, according to Article 5, is that each state gets equal representation in the Senate. It's the only thing today that can't be amended without, without unanimity among the states. Uh, uh, what else would be the consequences of national popular vote? I used to call it the Acorn Reempowerment Act, but fewer people understand that today. Uh, I mean, look, if... if if you run a political machine in New York or in Chicago or in Los Angeles, right, national popular vote would allow you to uh, swing presidential elections through ballot harvesting or whatever other means you can come up with in a way that, that doesn't matter today, right? Because winning, you know, winning California by with, with 60 percent or with 80 percent, it doesn't matter, right? The Electoral College incentivizes candidates to go to places where they're slightly behind and try to, you know, and try to win a few more people over there. You can't win by running up the score in places where you're already popular. NPV would change that. A NPV also, I mentioned this is the worst way to change the Electoral College. It, it really would be disastrous because each state in the compact would actually certify the national popular vote total for itself. And it's all trust and no verify, right? Reagan said trust and verify. This is all trust, no verify, right? I mean, it, it, imagine, imagine this scenario, which is easy, I think, to imagine, right? California voters are sitting around on Election Day in 2024, um, if national popular vote has taken effect, and they're watching MSNBC. And Rachel Maddow is telling them, you know, the Republican, it's, it's election day, it looks like things are going to be close, it looks like maybe the Republican candidate's slightly ahead, and Rachel Maddow is telling her friends in California, the only reason Republicans are, uh, you know, have a, have, even have a chance to win this election is because of voter suppression in the South. Right? What is the California Secretary of State going to do if the majority of that person's constituents, and by the way, you know, the California Secretary of State always wants to be either governor or senator, right, and eventually president of the United States, are they going to go with what their, what their constituents believe, right, which is that that, that, elect, that popular vote is illegitimate, or are they just going to put their rubber stamp on the popular vote result? And you could flip that around and say the same thing about, about uh, you know, Oklahoma or Texas, right? Are we just going to go along if we're hearing that the only reason why Democrats are slightly ahead in the presidential election is because there's a million illegitimate votes in California, are we really just going to go along with that? The National Popular Vote Compact literally says nothing about how to resolve election disputes, which makes sense if the objective is to create political instability. It doesn't really make sense any other way, uh, as far as I can figure out. And it would inevitably lead to a takeover of elections because the only solution at that point, whether you have a constitutional amendment or not, the, the only solution to that instability and to a lot of other concerns people would have about fairness that are, that are perfectly legitimate would be to centralize control over elections, right? Because if, I mean, if, if, if I have an election, you know, in a current presidential election, when I vote and, and Bill votes in Oklahoma, right, we, we know the rules in Oklahoma. Our ballots are, you know, presidential can candidates get on the ballot in a certain way. We cast our votes a certain way. They're counted a certain way. They're recounted if need be a certain way. And it doesn't have to be the same in Virginia, right? But if, if Virginia's ballots and Oklahoma's ballots are all thrown into the same ballot box, it violates a, a fundamental principle of fairness to then say, but you know, the way you cast your votes are, is going to be different, the way they're counted is going to be different, the way they're recounted is going to be different. You would have to centralize control. And frankly, conservatives would demand centralized control of elections if national popular vote ever took effect because it would be our only defense against election fraud in blue states. Right? We, we would demand it. Right? We would demand that the federal government take over elections because we wouldn't have any choice at that point. So where are we in this, in this fight? And, and Eagle Forum has been uh, really the greatest ally in this fight since, uh, since at the very beginning. Uh, and and I, I should say, too, uh, just 
as, as far as my own my own career and my own interest in all of this, uh, my, my first real job out of college was at the Council for National Policy, um, where Phyllis Schlafly was a workshop chairman, and my job was putting together the workshops. And so, uh, and, and so I, I got to work with her directly uh, quite a bit, and it was a great pleasure, and I learned a lot um, about the importance of institutions and also about how to, how to stop bad ideas. Um, and so I, I have to give a, a lot of credit to your mom for, for Save Our States and everything that we do. And, and uh, as I said, Eagle Forum has been, has been such a good ally right from the beginning um, with, uh, with so much help from, from Janine Hansen. Uh, where are we right now with national popular vote? I mentioned that there are 15 states plus the District of Columbia that have passed this. Um, all of those are blue states. And so sometimes conservatives say to me, well, look, they're running out of blue states. We don't have to worry about this. It looks scary, but they're not, they're not going to get there. Um, here's, here's the reality. As I mentioned, national popular vote basically has unlimited money. And, uh, and they are lobbying in every single state. And that's not hyperbole, right? What, wherever you are from, if your state hasn't adopted NPV, I guarantee that national popular vote has, has had people on the ground in your state. They are everywhere. Um, they've been in Oklahoma this year, um, w w I mean, which, is, which is just sort of mind-boggling to me because, I mean, I'm right there. We've, we, we, have, uh, we have sort of made this a radioactive enough issue that they couldn't even find a bill sponsor, but they were still there, right? They were still there with their lobbying team on the ground um, and, and using their favorite tactic, um, which I want to appeal to all of you to, to watch for this because this is their favorite tactic, but it's also their Achilles heel. Um, what National Popular Vote loves to do is to identify some Republican legislators uh, who are, you know, oftentimes they're, they're new or they're not, um, they're, they're probably not the kind of people who come to Eagle Forum meetings, and uh, they will take them on all expenses paid uh, trips to five-star tropical resorts. Um, I mean, you know, Ritz-Carlton, Puerto Rico used to be a place they went a lot. They, they took some people to, uh, to New York City once, but they seem to prefer the tropics. They've gone to the Ritz-Carlton, New Orleans, which, which uh, Nebraska, you know, a supposedly conservative Nebraska legislator get very angry with me when I brought this up. He actually sent a letter to all of my board members saying that I should be fired because I was questioning his integrity. And I went back on his Instagram feed and found pictures of him with the NPV lobbyists at the Ritz-Carlton, New Orleans. So, I, you know, I... If, if, that's, if, if I was impugning his integrity, then his integrity, uh, he should consider it impugned. Uh, <laughs> but but this, is, this is what they like to do, and, uh, and this has an effect. They did this in Michigan last year. They got a majority of Michigan Republican state senators to co-sponsor national popular vote and try to push it in their lame duck session last year. Now, we hit the ground there. Um, and, uh, and, and we worked with allies in Michigan, and, and frankly, as I say, this is their Achilles heel. When you expose that that's how they're lobbying for this, that they're trying to get state legislators to tinker with the Constitution in a fundamentally illegitimate way to change the rules in presidential elections, and they're doing it by buying your legislators Mai Tais and taking them to the beach, right? that tends to make people pretty angry. Um, it did in Michigan, it did in Oklahoma, it did in Arizona. Um, we stopped it dead in Michigan. They actually, I mean, they, the leaders in, in uh, both chambers ended up saying, we're not, don't worry, we, we're not going to give this bill a vote. Um, but in Oklahoma, before I had moved there, they got it through the Oklahoma State Senate, right? I mean, this is a supermajority Republican body. They got it through the Arizona House of Representatives. Um, I mean, with, with the, the tireless work of people like Janine and, uh, and myself and, and lots of you in the room, I know, we have been able to stop them in every red state and every purple state that wasn't completely controlled by the Democrats. But this is serious. Um, they're not going away, right? And after 2016, they, they now have a ground game. I mean, this, this got, became much more difficult after 2016 because they have a ground game. They have the resistance out there. Um, and after 2018, they won a lot more power in state legislative races, which allowed them to pick up, um, you know, not, not just Democrats, right? These are like hardcore progressive Democrats. They've shifted left, even in states like Delaware that have been Democrat for a long time. Um, they were able to pick up Delaware, New Mexico, um, and, uh, and Oregon, and Colorado. Colorado now... Uh, citizens have gathered signatures and put this on the ballot. So it's going to go to the ballot for a vote to repeal national popular vote in Colorado 
next November, the same as the presidential election. Uh, they uh, um, they almost got it through in Maine, but we got seven Democrats to flip back and uh, and stop it literally on the last day of the session in Maine. Uh, they uh, they passed it in Nevada, but the Democrat governor in Nevada vetoed it and said, "I'm not." Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, and his state. Yeah, his statement was exceptionally good. Um, I mean, and this is. I mean, the the, the work that was done in Nevada was uh, was just awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he point, he said, "Look, I I am not going to hand over my state's voice to Los Angeles, right? I mean, this is yeah, good common sense. I mean, and and I, I will say we, we should we should avoid making this a partisan issue to the extent that that we that we can, because there are a lot of Democrats who who recognize that you know if you're a Democrat and you're not from Los Angeles, Chicago, or New York, or you don't you know you're not a fellow traveler with that sort of Democrat, right? You're not an AOC Democrat." You, you recognize this would give the AOC wing of their party more power, right? And so a lot of Democrats see this as a threat. Uh, not, you know, not enough, but we're, we're working on it. Uh, so I, I listed the top concerns up there. Michigan, obviously, Minnesota, New Hampshire. This will have a vote. There's a study session in New Hampshire on October 3rd. It will get a vote um, next year because of the, the rules in New Hampshire. I, I think we're going to be okay. Virginia is a major concern with the legislative election coming up here. Um, national popular has been very active in Virginia, um, and uh, and obviously we're all watching the the state elections this year. Other states where national popular vote has been has been very present in their lobbying efforts. Um, Alaska, I mentioned Arizona, Arkansas, Maine, I mentioned um, Missouri, Nevada, North Carolina, Nevada that can't, can't come back next year, uh, thankfully, and Maine it can't come back next year either. Uh, North Carolina, um, I know they they've been very active there. And there's some concern about the legislative elections next year. Um, Pennsylvania, same thing. Uh, Utah and, and Wisconsin. Um, as, as long as we keep the firewall strong and keep NPV passing in, in any state where Democrats don't have complete control, unless there's a massive wave election, uh, we will be able to stop NPV. But we also have to be ready if things swing back in states that have adopted it like New Mexico, like Delaware, um, like Oregon, or, or anywhere else, to, to like Massachusetts. I was talking to a Massachusetts Democrat, actually, or my, my, one of my colleagues was um, in August, and uh, this Massachusetts Democrat said, yeah, I'm not sure this is a good idea. Um, we have to be ready to try to get states to repeal this. Um, and, and, you know, many of you, I'm sure, think that it's very analogous to ERA, right? The problem with national popular vote is it doesn't go away. Uh, so, so it's important not just to beat it, but to push it back, and to push it back as hard as we can. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, two, minutes. two minutes. Okay, that's perfect. That's all I need because I, I want to say something about how to defeat national popular vote. Uh, how to defeat it rhetorically, right? What what is the, what are the messaging points to defeat national popular vote? And I want to identify three different groups of people because it really depends on who you're talking to. One are the true believers. Another is the paid lobbyists, um, and then the uh, and then the third. Let's see, what's my third group? Um, my, well, my third group is the leftist opportunists. And frankly, when it comes to the paid lobbyists and the leftist opportunists, there's probably not very much um, that we can do other than expose them, right? We need to expose them. Um, but as far as the true believers, right, and and including including sort of conservative legislators who have maybe they you know maybe they had too many mai tais. And they started to buy into this, right? How how do we help them understand why national popular vote is the wrong direction? There, there are two kinds of arguments. One is specific to the national popular vote interstate compact, and I think this is very important um, because the national popular vote interstate compact is not well drafted. It is not stable. It is not something that would work. Even if someone would prefer to do away with the Electoral College, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact is illegitimate and dangerous, right? Even for people who, who want to move in that direction. And so that, that, that is one set of arguments that I think are, are important for us to be able to make. Um, because frankly, there, there are a lot of state legislators who just do not care that we're a Republican, not a democracy. Right? I wish that was not the truth. Hopefully, they'll read Bill's book, and then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll figure out um, some of this a little bit better. But the fact is that the easiest way to convince some legislators is just to help them understand national popular vote interstate compact is dangerous. 
right? Now, then there's the other set of arguments about the Electoral College. And these arguments work very well if you're talking with someone from rural America, small town America, right, or, or in a small state, uh, which is the fact that the Electoral College is, is, is a, it's a part of our system of checks and balances that's designed to make sure that big cities don't control everything. It contains election disputes in individual states, like the watertight compartments on an ocean liner, right? So if you have a problem in one state, it doesn't, it doesn't sink the whole ship, right? You have a problem in one state with the Electoral College, it's contained in that state. We can deal with it that way. You never need a nationwide recount with the Electoral College. And the Electoral College, and this is something that ought to, reson uh, to resonate with uh, Democrats today, the Electoral College is why presidential appointees do not run presidential reelections. Right, you think about it. I, I mentioned you would have to centralize power over elections in Washington, D.C. under any kind of a national popular vote system. You'd have to have one decision maker, and it would have to be in Washington, D.C. That means giving presidents more control over their own elections and reelections. That is a terrible idea, right? And, and in the age of Donald Trump, you would think that Democrats would understand that that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible idea. It would be bad if Barack Obama was in charge of his reelection in 2012, and it would be bad if, Barack, if, if Donald Trump was in charge of his reelection in 2020, right? If for no other reason, then it would, it would detract from people's faith in our system. So I, I've got my contact information or my email up there, my website up there. Um, I, I hope you will at least do this for me. When you see national popular vote in your state, let me know. Because I, I have a network of experts. Michael has a network of experts. We will get people into your state, right? We, we will fly people into your state to speak to meetings, to speak one-on-one -on -one with legislators, to testify at committee hearings. We can do that. Um, the, the only thing we need... Is, is to know about it ahead of time. And then, you know, if you can, if you can help us, you know, build a strategy in your state and get some grassroots out, even better. Uh, but at least just let me know. Trent uh, at SaveOurStates.com is the email address. Thank you all so much for everything that you do. Thank you, Trent. And I'll point out that we are going to have, uh, we do have a competition to uh, uh, Gail's uh, um, after session uh, breakout tonight at 930. There will be one on the Constitution that, uh, that Janine is going to lead on Electoral College and uh, Article 5. Um, so let's take a few questions. Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn McLarty from Oklahoma. Trent, we're so happy to have you there. I'm really, he's a real asset to us. But I, I, I'm on the Republican National Committee, and there's a gentleman that used to be on the committee that is really pushing this big time, getting paid big bucks. Just got to tell you this, when we had the issue going on in our state a couple of years ago, uh, I accidentally got an email from him about one of these trips, and it <laughs> listed the legislators who were going on the trip. So... I confronted my legislator, and it was a beautiful sight, as you can imagine. He was very upset with me. He accused me of hacking the House email system, which is such a joke if you know anything about me and working computers. <laughs> <laughs> but it came to the point that he sent the OSBI out to my home to investigate this. So this is how serious it got. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> and, and I, comment? I, yeah, no, I'd just be, I'd be happy to, to name names because uh, I remember once sitting in a meeting with Paul Weirich and, and somebody, somebody said something vague and he pounded on the table and said, names, give me names. So I'll give you names. Yeah. Saul Anousis. Uh, from for, Michigan. Yeah, former Michigan uh, uh, GOP chair. He's ran for RNC chair and didn't get it, I think, over, over this issue. Um, he's, I mean, he also lobbies for, for things like, uh, like subsidies to the wind uh, power industry these days. You, you, can, you, know, you can make more money as a Republican lobbying for Democrat causes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, right? And, and I mean, I suppose Democrats probably can make more money lobbying for Republican causes. And the, and the, other, the, other, uh, the, the other gentleman who, who travels around for them quite a bit is Ray Haynes, uh, who's a former Republican California state senator and was a national chair of, of ALEC. Um, which which uh, we, we have a uh, statement of principles on this now at ALEC, waiting for final approval from their board. 
uh, in part because Ray was was you know basically implying to state legislators that because he supported this, uh, the, the ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, supported it, which is not true. They've had strong resolutions against it. They they had expired. Hopefully, they'll have a new one by by the end of the year. Janine, thank you. Uh, Trent, I first want to tell you how much we appreciate all your work nationally and because you came to Nevada more than once over the years as we fought this and we did have a miracle in that the governor vetoed it uh, and that was truly a miracle. But I have a question about the recent court case in Colorado uh, where they stepped in and so could you explain that and just what happened and what the implications are? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so if, if you if you haven't seen this, the Tenth Circuit, based in Denver, uh, heard a case that had to do with uh, a couple of Hillary Clinton presidential electors who voted for somebody other than Hillary Clinton. When really the, the strategy, if you remember, was uh, we're going to I think they vote for Kasich or Bill Weld or somebody. They were trying to they were saying, well, we'll vote for some other you know Republican. Uh, and try to get some Republican electors to defect, and then we'll prevent Trump from becoming president. Colorado had a state law that says that you can't do that, that, that binds electors to vote for whoever they had pledged to vote for, who, there's, who their party's nominee is. And the Tenth Circuit, you know, a lot of – this had been, you know, in, in nerdy con law circles, this is a popular – it's been a popular topic of debate for a long time. Can states really bind a presidential elector on how to vote? Because these are – like I said, right, these are real elected officials holding an office created by the Constitution only for the purpose of voting for president. But, I mean, I would say um, I, I think the Tenth Circuit was right. The Tenth Circuit said you can't do that. I mean, these are real federal elected officials. You can't tell them uh, how to vote, just like you can't tell a U.S. senator how he has to vote, right? And even when U.S. senators were elected by state legislatures, the state legislature couldn't come back around and say, well, and now we're going to tell you how to vote in the Senate. Uh, and uh, so the, the Tenth Circuit decided uh, that, that state laws like that are invalid. There's a, there's a case from the Washington State Supreme Court that went the other direction. There, so there's, that, that means there's a decent chance that this goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think if it does, they'll probably side with the Tenth Circuit. Here's why this case is not that big of a deal. Um, because it, it, national popular vote doesn't have anything to do with telling presidential electors how to vote. It has to do with which presidential elector nominees get elected, right? And yeah, and so this, that's an important little nuance, right? Because some people have, have, have said, and actually Fox News actually had a, like they had an article after the Tenth Circuit case that implied that, that this, that, well, the Tenth Circuit case means that the national popular vote won't work because they can't force electors to vote a certain way. They don't have, that's not the, that's not the game, right? The game is to say that, you know, if uh, if Colorado goes for the Republicans, but the Democrats win nationwide, the Democrats' presidential electors in Colorado get elected. So that's, I mean, it's a weird thing because national popular vote and I actually agree on this, right? It just, it doesn't really have anything to do with it. And because of the, because of the party process for selecting presidential electors, uh, they, they are actually remarkably reliable, Right. Uh, we had a Republican elector in Oklahoma. He said, look, I always thought that the state law was invalid. I, and I would have loved to have violated the state law so that I could sue, so that I would be prosecuted and I could challenge it. This was before the Tenth Circuit case. But he said, I made an oath to my party. Right. I wasn't going to break my my word. Um, so which, you know, maybe the, maybe the Democrats will have more problem with faithless electors than Republicans. But I do think a lot of people on the Republican side are going to take that position. Right. I gave my word and I'm not going to break it. Thank you so much. I just want to mention I have a national alert list for Eagle Forum, uh, and if you want to be on my alert list, either on national popular vote or Article 5, you can give me your name, state, and email, and I will put you on there. And thank you again for your tremendous work. Thanks, Janine. Thank One last question. Me. Elaine? Yes, I'm Elaine Little from Alabama. Uh, just as an aside, I've been an elector in two different elections from Alabama, so I know how the process works. Uh, in 2000, there were plenty of people trying to get me to be a feckless elector, <laughs> but uh, I gave my word to the state party when they elected me to be an, a nominee for elector. But my question is this. Uh, if we get to the infamous 270 electoral vote, and they claim victory. What happens when we pull up Article 1, Section 10, Paragraph mm -hmm. 3 of our Constitution that says that 
no state can make a compact with another state without the consent of Congress? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, all, all these questions have been really, it's all the things that I didn't have time to say up there, so <laughs> thank you all for the, the question. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, uh, the, the, the simple, um, maybe unsurprising, but very disappointing answer is that the Supreme Court has heard multiple challenges to interstate compacts that had not received the consent of Congress, and they have never struck one down. They've never enforced that clause, and they basically interpreted it, to, interpreted it to mean this: if Congress doesn't object, then the then the compact goes into effect. Which is, I mean, which yeah, if you read the you read the language of the Constitution, I mean, that's that's insane. I mean, it, it's just it's just absurd. But uh, yeah, so so unfortunately, uh, hmm. I mean, if we're 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 talking to some people on the Hill. I mean, we want to we want to assert that in a really forthright way that that clearly, you know, this is not a compact over water rights or fishing rights. This is a compact over presidential elections. Surely the court would enforce it in this case. Uh, and even NPV, they started out, you know, 10, 12 years ago when they launched their campaign. They said, of course we don't need consent of Congress. And now they backtrack to saying, well, if we do need consent of Congress, we'll just get it later. And I think they're hoping that, you know, maybe there's a wave election their direction. Uh, in 2020 or 2022, because it's only a simple majority in Congress, right? It's not a supermajority. Um, but, uh, but, but, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, unfortunately, um, I, I mean, this is an issue where I don't think we can count on the courts, and even on the substance of it, right? I mean, the the fact that that national popular vote violates the original intent of the of the Constitution in Article Two. I mean, it it clearly is is abusing state legislative power because the power is only there to figure out how to represent their own states. And if you actually look at that part of the Constitution, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature there may derive, right? The, 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 the power comes from the state. The legislature just get figure, to figure out how to do it. And giving it away is not, in my mind, is not a way to figure out how to do it. The problem is um, your, your more constitutionalist legislators or, or, or uh, uh, justices and judges are also your more restrained, right? And we want them to be restrained. We don't want them to be activists. But they're much more likely to say, hey, look, this is a political dispute. We're not going to get involved in election rules if we can help it. And so, you know, I think even there it would be really easy uh, for, you know, at least for certain justices to, set, to just punt on that issue. And those are justices who'd be on our side. Um, right, all the activists who'd be glad to to take a hold of a case and change presidential election rules, they would all come to the wrong conclusion anyway. Um, so the, I, I'm I'm working with a group to to build a litigation strategy in case we get to 270. But frankly, we have to stop this in state legislatures. We thank just you, have Jen. to. Thank you, thank you, this uh, panel on uh, history and constitution. We're going to break. We come back here for lunch, 12:15. See you then. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. Oh, thank you for having me.